You're listening to the Mind Over Murder podcast. My name is Bill Thomas. I'm a writer, consulting producer, and now podcaster. I am now trying to use my experience as the brother of a murder victim to help other victims of violent crime. I'm working on a book on the Unsolved Colonial Parkway Murders, and I'm the co-administrator of the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook group, together with Kristen Dilley. My name is Kristen Dilley. I'm a writer, a researcher, a teacher, and a victim's advocate, as well as the social media manager and co-administrator for the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook page with my partner in crime, Bill Thomas. Welcome to Mind Over Murder. I'm Kristen Dilley. And I'm Bill Thomas. Today, we have some great news that we're going to start with to kick off our podcast. And that is some excellent news from Virginia, where I am from. We were absolutely thrilled earlier this week to learn that Virginia has ended its backlog of sexual assault kits. Starting in 2015, Attorney General Mark Herring made a commitment to complete testing on all of the backlogged rape kits. He announced earlier this week that that testing has been completed And because we like numbers, here are some numbers for you. There were ultimately 2,665 sexual assault kits tested with 851 DNA profiles entered into the national database and 354 DNA profile matches sent to law enforcement for additional investigation. This is really exciting news. That means that there are 354 potential matches there. We cannot highlight enough the work of Attorney General Mark Herring. This is outstanding work. He made the commitment and he followed through with law enforcement and members of the Virginia legislature. This is really impressive. And there's only seven states in the entire country who've actually eliminated their backlog. So there is a lot more work to be done in the two to 400,000 cold case rape kits currently sitting on law enforcement shelves. In the richest country in the world, I can't believe we can't find the money to test two to 400,000 rape kits and get them entered into the CODIS system. And it was interesting that all of this testing had to be done using grants uh, to make sure that all of this was taken care of. So ultimately, it took $3.4 million of, of grant money to complete all of this testing, but it was done. Ending the backlog is a cause that is near and dear to our hearts here on Mind Over Murder. We're absolutely thrilled to hear this wonderful news. So hats off to Attorney General Mark Herring for all of his hard work in making sure that the backlog in Virginia was eliminated. We should also highlight the outstanding work of End the Backlog, the organization who are working with all 50 states to find the funding and the initiative to move their cold case rape kits forward for testing. They're doing outstanding work and we very much support what they're doing. We do have some interesting news of our own here. We are going to start working in partnership with our friends at Othram Labs to offer a new segment here on the podcast that we hope you all will find very interesting. We're going to discuss opportunities for our listeners to become citizen detectives in open cases. Now, we're still working out all of the details with our friends at Othram, who, in the interest of full disclosure, are becoming a sponsor of this program. But the idea is that Othram, working in partnership with Mind Over Murder and local law enforcement, will be highlighting cases. Now, not all of these are homicides. Some of these are unidentified remains and other cases that are currently open. They're not all necessarily cold cases either. All of them require additional work on the forensic side, and Othram has offered to work on these cases. So there'll be various elements, which I think could be very interesting and exciting for our listeners as ways to get involved. We are definitely looking forward to presenting this information to all of you, and we hope that you will enjoy the opportunity to get a little bit more hands-on in terms of helping solve these cases. We do want to encourage you to continue to rate and review Mind Over Murder on your podcast platform. So wherever you happen to be listening, whether it's Apple or Spotify, please do take a couple of minutes and leave us a five-star rating. 
and your support, as always, is very much appreciated. Now, this week, we are rejoined by Colleen Fitzpatrick, one of the top forensic genealogists in the country. We are continuing our conversation on the Grim Sleeper case, and Colleen gets into a really great discussion with us explaining how all of the science works. If you give this segment an opportunity and a careful listen, I think by the end of the episode, you'll find yourself with a much better understanding of how this science works and how this is cracking cold cases across the country. Thank you so much for listening to Mind Over Murder. We'll see you next time. Welcome to Mind Over Murder. I'm Kristen Dilley. And I'm Bill Thomas. Joining us again this week is forensic genealogist and rocket scientist and all-around Renaissance woman, Colleen Fitzpatrick. Colleen, welcome back to Mind Over Murder. Hello. Uh, thanks for having me again. I really loved my first time, and I'm glad I'm back. Either you're a glutton for punishment or, <laughs> right. or so kind to the two of us that you were willing to come back. We really oh, appreciate it. Maybe a little of both. So there you go. Well, first of all, tell us a little bit about what's going on with you. You have some news. Uh, yeah, I want to say I left DNA Doe Project a couple of weeks ago. I am the co-founder. Everybody knows that. And I left, and now I'm concentrating on Identifinders International, which is my company since 2011. And I've done genetic genealogy through that, probably worked on several hundred cold cases by now. I do a wider variety of cases. You know, I do violent crimes. I do doe cases. I do baby does. I do a lot of Holocaust work. That's very interesting. Um, I've done military IDs and fraud cases. So I have a, a broader base of interest than just John and Jane Doe's, which was fine. But now, you know, I work on quite a bit of things. Oh, it's funny. One of the interesting cases I know you've worked on, I just bought the book Flight of Gold that you had recommended, and it's on uh -huh. my stack of true crime books that okay. I need to work my way through. Kristen's always way ahead of me in the <laughs> reading department. I don't know okay. how, I think she stays up even later than I do. Oh, yeah, I'm pretty late. <laughs> yeah, I'm way behind. I, you know, I read too much on the internet, and then I, <laughs> then I, watch uh what is it series uh streaming series and stuff like that sure so yeah i'm me, way behind on my reading yeah me too i'm also usually proposing to pamela my partner oh let's watch a movie and of course by the time i get around to saying let's watch a movie it's nine <laughs> or ten o'clock at night and she's like really <laughs> uh, yeah. we're not gonna make it to the end of the movie right so you can always pick up later but it's not as fun yeah this is true so uh -huh. a big Focus now for you on Identifinders, your company, since 2011. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. going to be keeping you pretty busy, though, with all of the different oh. cases that you work on. Yeah, more than busy. I'm just <laughs> more than busy. It's it's fun. I, I hate to say, you know, oh, no, another homicide, right? Oh, my God, I'm so excited. That's so much fun. You know, you have to think about it when you say things like that. But I'm very busy. Gosh, I'm very busy. And, you know, I have long term projects like the Holocaust work I do that is very interesting. And, you know, you have Holocaust survivors, which are John and Jane Doe's. And I want to say that out of nothing, we're so close to identifying some of them. One was a, a, a child given to two strangers walking to a train station in 1942 and found her parents or her mother, at least so. It's amazing what you can do. We live in a world where you can, it's magic almost, what DNA can tell you. So there you go. I'm just really busy. Well, and certainly when you get to the other end of those investigations and you found worthwhile, incredible information that was never available before, that's got to be a yeah. good feeling. Wow, it is. You know, and how would you know, you know, if you if you're looking at a if you arrive at a suspect in one case who's like half Portuguese and half Lebanese or half Portuguese, half Syrian, how would you you know, you come up with that in genealogy and how would you know walking down the street to be able to say who's who? You know, how could you uh, you know that how is that information useful, which it is, 
And how do you get it? And what does it mean? And it's a whole new way of looking at things. Yeah, there's an element of humanity, I think, that's so important to the work that you do that it's pretty, I think, inspiring is the word that comes to mind. Yeah. Well, thank you. I especially like the Holocaust work in that regard. There are people out there that have absolutely no idea who they are. I mean, of course, we have adoptees. You know, we're all familiar with that. But when you look deep down, you know, people in the Holocaust lost all their family, you know, lost everything. And there's nobody really to say there's no adoption records. There's nobody to say, yeah, I'm the I know where she came from. And that's my cousin. You know, the only way you're going to do it is through DNA, really. Well, you have our eternal thanks and, and gratitude, and we love the work that you do, and we really appreciate the fact that you come on and talk okay. to us mere civilians here at Mind <laughs> no, Over Murder. No, no, it's fun. It's fun. And, you know, we, of course, I do a lot of violent crime, you know, homicides and rapes and, you know, that kind of thing, kidnapping. So that's mainly what we're going to talk about, I think, today, some of the aspects of that, which is very gratifying. It's also humanitarian work in my mind to bring now, I don't believe in closure. You know, if you solve a case and you let the family know, you know who killed their loved one. It's not like closure, like, oh, I'm so glad we know. OK, end of story. What it really is, is more information, more release. You're, bring, you're bringing them a, an opportunity to release the past, not worry about it anymore and put their efforts into the future, into coming to terms with what happened rather than wondering about what might have happened that's an excellent way to look at it yeah beautifully so, said right thank you. you you channel your energy into positive stuff into becoming whole again so how did you get involved with the grim sleeper case in los angeles tell us a little bit about that well that, that's actually an interesting story i i don't remember how the detective got in touch with me his name was cliff shepherd he was on, uh, at the time, he's retired now, and he was on the Los Angeles, he was in the Los Angeles Police Department. And he happened to be coming to Orange County because he had to be present at the trial of Rodney Akala, who was the dating game killer. If you don't know about him, that's another podcast, or please look it up. It's a oh, very yeah. interesting story. It's a very interesting case. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I've seen the clip of him on the dating game. And the woman actually picked him as the date. And when they went behind the scenes, she refused. She wouldn't go on a date with him because he was so weird and was weird. So he had just killed a woman, one of his victims, a couple of weeks earlier. You know, so she was lucky. She just didn't take the date. And then, of course, then they found out who he was eventually. So yeah. so Cliff Shepard came down. He was in Orange County. And he I, I don't remember how he got in touch with me, but he did. And he came actually to our house. And he uh, we spent, you know, most of the day explaining about genetic genealogy, about why DNA, you know, how it could produce a possible name for the assailant or the killer. Very interesting. He was soaking it in. I could tell he was going to figure out how to do it by himself if he wanted to, but you know, I didn't care. When I just you know, wanted to help him. He gave me the Y profile on the case, and I ran it through, I probably ran it first through, there was a website called Y Search, which was sort of like the Y DNA Jed match in a way, where you could click in your Y DNA markers and see if you matched anybody in the database. Wait, let's go a little bit more slowly for the benefit of all of our listeners. So all right. Cliff Shepard had a, a DNA sample with him electronically, in other words, a, a way okay, of had, conveying it to had, you. Yeah, they already probably had run CODIS on the Grim Sleeper. Right. And CODIS, when they do... and. Let's see, this must have been around the time they were also getting into familial searching on that. So when you do familial searching, you not only use CODIS, you use a wide DNA profile. And can you go, explain again for our listeners' benefit a little bit about Y DNA as well? Okay, yeah. Well, the whole genetic genealogy revolution started with Y DNA. 
because Y DNA, Y the Y chromosome is one of the chromosomes, and it follows the male line of the family along with the family name. So back in 2000, there were several companies founded on the basis of offering Y DNA testing to genealogists as a way of studying their family names in the absence of documentation. So for example, when I found out about this, I signed my brother up, or it took a while to do this because it was very new. I got my brother tested. I founded a Fitzpatrick DNA study, and I signed my brother up to have his Y DNA tested and his Y profile generated because I had pretty much exhausted every document in the world on my family. I had been to Ireland maybe once or twice. I couldn't go any further with the materials I had and with the people I had spoken to. And only Fitzpatrick's I ever knew were the ones I grew up around. So I had my brother do the Y test, hoping to find another Fitzpatrick or really anybody that matched on his Y chromosome. Because if I did, that would mean they were relatives along the direct male line of the family. And talking to the other person, I could back in the documentation later. I could find out how that person, say, wound up in New York. What part of Ireland was he from? Does he know what time, what year did his family arrive? Did he, does he know if he had somebody in his family with the same names as my family, you know, you could, once you had that wide DNA match, it opened the door to a lot of other research you could do. So Y DNA would not necessarily tell you the exact connection. It wouldn't lie. It wouldn't tell you something wrong. And on the other hand, documentation could tell you specific relationships, but it could be wrong or it could not exist in the first place. So the strengths of the DNA testing were the covered the weaknesses of the documentation and the strengths of the documentation covered the weaknesses of the DNA. Right. So in about 2000, there were several companies formed, you know, to offer Y DNA testing to the genealogy community. And when that happened, the Y markers they used for genealogy were the same ones that were eventually put into into use by the forensic community. Fast forward, when I started working with Y-DNA, it turned out different agencies could give me the Y profile they have from a crime generated from crime scene DNA. And because the markers were same, I could go into the genealogy databases and make a comparison to see if I could find a match in the genealogy databases. And if I did, that match was usually keyed off of a last name or, you know, maybe a nationality, maybe descendants from a famous person. If I found a match, they, that gave what we now call forensic intelligence that otherwise was not available. Because in, in the legal world, you're looking just for a Y match. It's not keyed on the last name or anything. Y DNA is used in a different context. But in genealogy, it's keyed off the last name. So that's the use of that. So when Cliff Shepard came, I imagine I had a conversation with him before that, which I don't recall. The premise was that if he gave me the Y DNA from the crime scene and I ran it through, tried to find a match in the genealogy databases, and I did find a match that would give him a possible last name for the Grim Sleeper. And if I'm remembering correctly, it was Y DNA that helped you crack the Phoenix Canal killer case. Am, yes, am I remembering that, that right? That was the first case that was solved using genetic genealogy. And it was based on Y DNA only because in 2014, I think when this happened, maybe 15, the autosomal, the SNP testing we do now was not as mature. And the databases were not really that large. It just wasn't ready to go. So back then, I was only using the Hawaii DNA. And Cliff Shepard coming to our house about 2009, 2010 was one of the first uses of that. And it was on the Grim Sleeper case, which was a very compelling case. It was one of those cases like, you know, the Golden State Killer later on that they really needed to solve because the guy 
in this case was still probably may it be still active. You know, it hadn't been that long since the last victim, his last victim. And so there was just this real compelling reason to figure out who he was. And they were pulling out all the stops, trying to find, you know, use any kind of tool that was available that could help identify who he was. My guess is this conversation that you had with Detective Cliff Shepard had to be 2009 because they arrested Lonnie Franklin Jr. in 2010, is my recollection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was in 4th of July weekend. Do you remember if Cliff Shepard referred to the case as the Grim Sleeper case in your conversations with him? I don't know because it was that case. Now, whatever the name was given for the Mm -hmm. case, I don't know, but it was definitely that case. I knew what it was. I knew what case it was. Right. But I, I don't remember, you know, the details of the conversation. Yeah. And of course, we're going back a ways. 11 years ago. Did you run the profile while Cliff was there at, at your home in Orange County in California? Uh, I did. He sat there at our kitchen table, which is also <laughs> our cor- corporate office. <laughs> I've been, at, did, I've been I, at that kitchen table. Cliff was sitting there observing And of course, I could tell he wanted to know how to do it, which is fine. He gave me the profile. And at that time, I'm pretty sure I I know what I did if, you know, it's standard for me. At the time, they had a website called Y-Search. And that was a website you could click in your Y-DNA numbers, you know, your profile. And you clicked and searched. And it it was a public database. You had to log in. You could... Well, you could also kind of do a hit and run. You could just click in the numbers and not be in the database. And at that time, uh, you know, I did a search and I could not find, you know, a match in that public database. We had developed software that could search other databases in general, just like they could search the individual ones, Fitzpatrick or, you know, Smith, Jones, Thomas even. You know, I don't know if I used that or not. I probably did while he was sitting there. It took me more than five minutes. It took me a while. And in the end, I didn't find a match to his wife profile. But what I did come up with was the guy was African-American. How did you know that? I think that there was another tool at the time called WIT Athlete at the Haplogroup Predictor. And what that is, is DNA, you know, the Y profile. Okay, my brother has Y DNA this is his Y DNA markers. It pertains to him. But somebody who's knowledgeable can step back and look at that DNA and say, results and say, that's Caucasian, that's African American, that's Native American, Oriental, you know, that's uh, continental Europe. So DNA not only has like specifics to a person, it also has sort of a flavor to it. The way I describe it in my seminars is that if you walk, in your house and somebody's cooking Italian food, you can know that right away by the flavor, the smell, but you won't know they're fixing lasagna until you get into the kitchen. So the haplo group or the population group is like the smell. It's like, you know, it's a uh, Caucasian European, you know, it's the kind of DNA it is. And then going and seeing somebody's cooking lasagna is like, identi- you know, associating it with that with a particular person or a particular family. So, I used a tool called, uh, I'm imagining, I guess I did this, Wit at the Haplogroup Predictor, where you could click in your, your Y profile, all of your values, marker values, and click it in, and it would tell you what haplogroup this person belonged to. So it would tell you, well, there's the different names are R1B, J1A, you know, there's different names for them, but basically what kind of ethnicity they were and kind of where in Europe, in a broad sense, they could come from. Mediterranean, British Isles, continental Europe, India, China, you know, very broad brush. So I clicked in these values and I came up, I remember looking up at him and saying African-American. And his face, I could see that was an impact. It meant something more than anything because in the law enforcement world they don't have these tools you know they look for matches or they don't look for matches but in genealogy we can look for ethnic background names you know geography so when i said that i saw his face changed i 
I knew it meant something important. Yeah. And so no poker face uh, on Cliff Shepard at that moment. He, he, no, not for the first You could tell it had an impact in terms of maybe the kind of person they were looking for as a suspect. Yeah, yeah. It, not not in the first few microseconds, but he did right. recover very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> well, most police officers do an impassive face pretty well. Yeah. He, he wasn't also dealing with you as a as a suspect or whatever that, that he might over an interrogation room table. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It was, you know, just one of those Kodak moments that you remember and <laughs> in its own way. <laughs> yeah. So then I said, well, I said, African man. And he said, well, after a while, he said, can you tell me what he looks like? How dark his skin is? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I said, he said, well, you know, he could have a Caucasian mother. He could have other you know, mix in his background. I said, I can't tell you that. I really can't. I said, I'm a guess he's dark skinned, but I, you know, that's all I can really tell you right. as far as that goes. Right. And he kind of, you know, kind of tap danced it away. Like, well, that doesn't really help because we don't know how dark his skin is. And, and I kind of didn't really believe that statement. I really, because of his reaction, I kind of thought it was important for that somebody to tell him that based on DNA and not based on, say, any other evidence or eyewitness or otherwise suspects that they may have had on the list. And so we talked about it for a while. And I, I remember also commenting, at least at one point, that I thought that because he was African-American along the male line of his family, that his name was probably a very common name or somewhat common, you know, regular UK, regular name, like, you know, maybe Carpenter would be, you know, there were a lot of African-Americans after the Civil War that took on names like Carpenter or Smith, not Castro Giovanni, not Wayne Glinsky or anything, but more, you know, a common name here in the U.S. I remember telling him that and I said, you know, I've just you probably have 13 million suspects in the L.A. area now. I just narrowed it down to six. Do I get the reward? <laughs> <laughs> what was his response? He says no. <laughs> One of the most frequent questions we're asked here at Mind Over Murder is, how can I help? Thanks to Othram, a leading forensic DNA testing lab for law enforcement, you can get involved and help solve real cases. If you have tested at a consumer genetics company, you can contribute your data to dnasolves.com. The process is easy and confidential. Just two simple steps. Your DNA might be the missing piece that helps solve the identity of an unknown person. Then Mind Over Murder will highlight cases Othram is working on to seek your crowdfunding support for DNA testing to help solve these cold cases. Upload your DNA profile to dnasolves.com. It's easy, free, and confidential. Then join Mind Over Murder as we help families find answers with Othram and dnasolves.com. Do you like our show, Mind Over Murder, and want to create your own podcast? Well then, let us tell you about Anchor. First of all, it's free. And who doesn't love free, right? I like free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. You can even add any song from Spotify directly to your episodes. The possibilities are endless for what you can create, whether it's music analysis, your own radio show, or something the world's never heard before. Anchor will then distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcast, and many more platforms. And you can even make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. I like the sound of that. It's everything you need to make a podcast all in one place. Right here, Anchor. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started on your own podcast. You can tell them Kristen and Bill from Mind Over Murder sent you. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. You didn't quite give me enough <laughs> as a lead. Said, well, it might lead to his arrest, you know, so we joked about that a little bit. So that was really my involvement, although I did stay in touch with him and I did read a lot. I did research on the case. 
you know, I wanted to see if I came up with any potential suspects that I could relate to him. And I, you know, it never really did. And I really didn't want to interfere. You know, the police have their information they don't share. Um, but I did stay in touch and he knew I was available if something came up. So there you go. Very, very interesting. Did you circle back with Detective Shepard as other thoughts occurred to you in the in the coming months as you read about the case and thought about the information that you had available to you? I, I did occasionally. You know, I did. I stayed in touch with him. But of course, it's a it's a one way stream of information. You know, we never really talked again. He came a couple of times to the house. And it's funny, he came one day, I believe he came one, maybe one and a half days to discuss all this. And then later in the week, he came in the afternoon because the air conditioner broke down at the courthouse and he didn't want to go home. I guess he had that half a day that he didn't expect to have. So he might as well put it to use. So he came over again. And we talked some more. And you had working air conditioning. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, we were. Yeah. See that. Well, we were closer to the beach. So it was a lot cooler and more comfortable <laughs> in the kitchen there than sitting in a courthouse and dying so and it was, anyway wasn't the courthouse in santa Ana, which can get pretty toasty is yeah, my recollection yeah. yep yep that's where it is so, so he figured he'd be able to visit with you get more information learn about this thing mm-hmm. where you guys you were calling it genealogy at that point but not necessarily forensic genealogy i would have called it forensic genealogy simply because it was the only term there you know it, I wrote the book on forensic genealogy in a hobby sense, but the important thing is the term stuck. As that went forward, as of about 2009 or early 10, that was really the only term that was being kicked around. Genetic genealogy more or less referred to genealogy side. Forensic genealogy was taking on the application of genetic genealogy to the legal profession. And even though it started out in a hobby sense, it became, you know, more legal oriented. So I think, you know, I, I would have referred to it as forensic genealogy at that point. But again, I don't, I don't really remember the, the specifics of the conversation so much, except for the part about his face, African-American. Oh, oh, and then, inter- no, well, how, in the part about how dark is his skin. Mm-hmm. And I also said, you know, you might want to do, have you done profiling and stuff like that? You know, I asked him a few questions, but again, it's a one way stream of information because you know quite to his quite respecting him you know he he couldn't really share a lot on the investigation with anybody you know so that's fine and that's been our experience with law enforcement in my sister's case the colonial parkway murders and in others i think both Kristen and i have found law enforcement folks for the most part they want to ask questions and get Uh answers and they're really not great about giving you too much information. First of all, I think they're trying not to steer the conversation or your answers. They'd like as much sort of direct unalloyed response Mm -hmm. as you have to give. And as as I've said to the agents handling my sister's case, look, I'm going to provide information to you because something I say that might mean nothing to me could Mm -hmm. mean something to an investigator who is sometimes years deep into a particular line of inquiry. Yeah, right. And I have to respect that. You know, that I, that's fine. I'll, I'll help it wherever I can. And I'm not there to just get, you know, news that nobody else has. So I can go tell a hundred of my best friends don't, you know, I'll tell you, but promise not to tell anybody else. I have to respect the law enforcement people for that, way of handling things. That's fine with me. It makes sense. It does. Right. And you don't want, you don't want to tell anybody, you know, you don't want to share that information because you don't know where, how it's going to change. You don't know if you tell somebody what they're going to say to somebody else. And it's not what you just said because they're not law enforcement and misinterpreted, you know, your reason for saying it or what you exactly explained. So You just don't want to get it muddy. You want to keep things clean and straight. And the best way is to have that one-way conversation. You've done a wonderful job educating us so far on DNA and genealogy, but I know that I still feel a little lost sometimes. So for people like me who may be a little slow on the uptake, can you do a a quick user-friendly explanation of what 
goes into searching for familial DNA? I can't. And I want to preface this by saying that familial searching, the term, is sometimes misused. Familial searching pertains to what law enforcement does with CODIS markers. It is misused, often mixed up with genetic genealogy, where you are searching for family members. But the proper, the real official term is familial searching is not genealogy. It's another operation that law enforcement does in the world of the CODIS markers and the CODIS database. So what it is, is most genealogists are familiar with Y markers. They're called YSTRs. And STR stands for short tandem repeat. And the key word in that is short. So that means the markers that lie along the Y DNA that you happen to need to look at to do genealogy have a length. Some of them are short, some of them are longer than others, but they're short, long, short, long. They're pieces of real estate that have some kind of value to you researching your family. And it's also value for law enforcement, too. There's markers there that are worth it. Well, it turns out that if you look at the rest of the chromosomes out there, they have STRs on the on the other chromosomes as well. And those are autosomal STRs. They're on the autosomal DNA. They're on the other. And so when the grim sleeper was around, there were I think there were 13 CODIS markers and they have now increased to 20. And what those are are patches or real estate. STRs on on the autosome, other markers, and each CODIS marker is on a different chromosome. You know, with Y-DNA, you usually have a string of numbers, but because you get into the other chromosomes, there are pairs. The CODIS markers, if you looked at a CODIS profile, it wouldn't be a string of numbers like on the Y-DNA. It would be pairs, a string of pairs of numbers, because you have two chromosomes in each pair. So if you have a CODIS marker in chromosome 10, then you're going to have one marker. You're going to have two markers there because you have two chromosome 10s. One came from mom and one came from dad. So if you looked at a CODIS profile, you would have today 20 pairs of markers. And that would belong, those would be characteristic of the person you just tested. So when CODIS was first set up, the idea was we'll find patches of real estate, we'll call them CODIS markers, and we will pick places that are well characterized, they're easy to replicate, they don't have anything to do with medical conditions or how you look, phenotypic traits. We know they do now, but at the time they were looking for you know no medical connections. And so they came up, law enforcement, DOJ, came up with these patches of real estate called the CODIS markers that they started using for human identification. And what they did, the original purpose was, say you get DNA from a crime scene, you generate the CODIS markers, you go to the lab, the guy with the white coat and the pipette runs it through some machine, and out the other end comes electronic numbers, which are translated into your CODIS profile. So the purpose was you collect DNA from a crime scene, make the CODIS markers, put it into a database called the CODIS database, and then if another crime down the road was committed, then you could put that second CODIS profile into the database and see if you got a match. And you were looking for exact matches, one-to-one, because you would have, if you put a new CODIS profile in there and you match something already in there, you'd have some kind of probability that the same guy committed the second crime that committed the first crime. So it's a one-to-one, one-to-one. And the CODIS database got bigger and bigger. I think right now it probably has 15 million convicted offenders in it. And there were certain laws where you could take DNA, put it in the CODIS database, other laws where it wasn't appropriate. You know, So there's a lot of legal background behind that. Well, when the Golden State Killer came around, You know, the thought was that this was already being done in the UK. If you have a very close relative, he's going to share more of his CODIS markers with whoever you're looking for than somebody who's not related. So the thought came about, can we do familial searching? Can we search for not one to one anymore, but I call it like one to close 
it's not exact, but the person we came up with shares a little bit more of these markers than somebody that probably isn't related at all. So there was a lot of thought on, can we do this for the, this case? Because, of course, it's a very compelling case. You want to get the guy off the street. You want to identify him. He's going to go and kill some more. But this tool has never been used before. And that's what came about. And I don't have, an, you know, the inner information on the pro- decision-making process. But in the end, it was agreed that California should go or should start practicing, I should say, familial searching, especially, you know, and it was prompted by this case. Our understanding from our research is that the LAPD and the prosecutors agreed that they would approach then California Attorney General Jerry Brown, who was later governor of California, with this specific case and ask for permission to search. If I'm not mistaken, Kristen, I think they wanted to search in the California penal system specifically. And yeah. the and the database of offenders in the California system to see if they could find someone who might be a relative mm-hmm. of the perpetrator. They had right. DNA right. from the Grim Sleeper case. There had been multiple murders at that point. About ten or eleven, I think. Um, if Kristen, if I have my numbers right, the attorney general set up a series of criteria that as if they had exhausted all other available methods at that mm-hmm. time, mm-hmm. that he would allow this search to be conducted. Mm-hmm. And yeah. if, if I'm not mistaken, it was a dead end at first. Mm-hmm. They didn't get a hit. And it wasn't until later when Lonnie Franklin Jr., the suspect's son, Christopher, was arrested on another non-related offense And he was obligated to provide his DNA, which went into the system, that Mm -hmm. they got the hit. And I think at this point, we're in probably in the 2009, 2010 timeframe that you were describing to us a moment ago. Yeah, yeah. I believe that what happened, you know, it was agreed that this should move forward. I believe that the case was referred to the Department of Justice Bureau of Forensic Science. And I, I believe that's internal to California, Cal DOJ. I believe that's correct. And after they came up with a familial match, which meant not an exact match, but somebody close enough, that it was referred to the familial search committee. They had formed a committee to really review the results, and it required unanimous vote on that committee to pass the identification of who they had found in the database to the LAPD so they could start the investigation. It was a unanimous Vote. I think it required unanimous agreement by the people at the DOJ and to pass it to the Familiar Search Committee, which happened. And then the Familiar Search Committee unanimously voted to pass it to LAPD to move forward with this. I want to make it clear that there's one other step. This is a two-step process. You're looking for, let's say, somebody who, who's close. It's not exact, but shares certain number of LLs, certain number of markers. But there's a second step because you will generally find many people share some kind of, you know, commonality or have. There are some very common markers that lots of people have, and there's some rare markers. So it's not just how many you share, but how how rare those markers are, and they are ranked according to probability of being a relative. Now, I know that Cal DOJ does the top 150 people on that list. Now, the second step is most of those are male. Let's say most of them, just for the argument, let's say they're all male for the moment. The second step is to take Y DNA, the Y profile, and compare it to the Y profile of all 150 of those people. And if the Y profile doesn't match, then you can say it's not a relative along the male line and you can mostly rule it out. And in the case of the Grimms, in the case of women, let's say you may have women on that list because there are women in the convicted offender database. You maybe do more markers. You do more work because they don't have we don't have Y chromosome. That's another story. But what happens is that it's a two step. You look for those familial search matches and then you follow it with the Y DNA. In the case of the Grim Sleeper, in 2008, they did the first search, which came up empty. 
In the meantime, they did another search in 2010. I think it was April 2010. In the meantime, the Grim Sleeper's son had been arrested on a weapons charge. He had been arrested for carrying a concealed weapon, which is a felony, and he was required to give his DNA. So he was now in the database. So when they came back in later April 2010, they came up with the familial search, and he was not the top on the list. The son was actually the third person of that 150, but his Y DNA match. So they could tell by the pattern of the CODIS markers almost matching, but not quite, that the person in the database had one marker for each CODIS pair. So they deduced that this must be either the father or the son of the Grim Sleeper. And because of the ages, age range and everything, they figured the man in the database would have been a toddler when some of these crimes were committed. So they deduced that the person in the database must be the son of the Grim Sleeper because also the Y DNA matched. So it had to be a male right? Male relative and sharing half the DNA at that point. Okay. So they were pretty sure, you know, they had, let's say a good candidate. There's always probability, you know, what is the probability that this man is the son or what's the probability that this man is a grim sleeper compared to somebody random on the street? You have to say it in that context. Now, even though they had their candidate, their suspect, they still had investigative work to do. They had to find the neighborhood. Was he, was he in the area or was he in Japan, you know, in the military when all this was happening? Did he live in the right place? Was he the right age? Could you prove paternity for this person in the database? You know, stuff like there's a lot of other stuff that went into that. And then after they said, OK, you know, big chance we have the right guy. They had to go collect DNA surreptitiously so that they could compare that DNA to the crime scene, and that would give them probable cause to go make an arrest. So this was all done very carefully, very thoughtfully, and there were many steps in the process. It wasn't, oh my God, we have a hit, let's go arrest him. You had to do all the probability. You had to find out it was probably the father. You had to do the wide DNA. You had to do the investigative work to make sure you had the right person. And then you had to go collect DNA to give you probable cause to go make the arrest. And then once they had arrested him, they had to take another DNA sample from him as the evidentiary sample that would go forward in the court system. You know, they had to show him sitting there giving the DNA and it matched the crime scene and that what that's what would be used as you know a reference sample to show that his DNA matched. He was to a certain degree of probability he was grim sleep. Even as you've said in interviews with us before and things we've read, the familial DNA hit is still more or less just a tip. In other words, that this is worth exploring, but you're going to have to do a lot of traditional police work to confirm that this suspect is the right guy. Correct. It's just a lead. And just like any lead, there's other physical evidence and evidence that has otherwise eyewitness accounts, whatever you have, that has to come together and be consistent. It's not just, oh, we have a familial match. It looks good. There's a lot of to go on. There's a lot of thought. Nobody wants to do it wrong. What makes the attorney general or the Justice Department or whomever else is getting kind of heebie-jeebie about familial DNA searching, what makes people so nervous about the concept of using familial DNA searches? Well, I can't, I can't really answer that. I can only say from my point of view what I think that is. I think it's just nervousness, not understanding the process. For one thing, you know, what I've described is something I've, you know, thought about. I'd say a lot of people don't read to that depth. There's concern also about people in the database. You know, their DNA was taken for a certain purpose, you know, a one-to-one match. And now, you know, somebody in the database, like the Grim Sleeper's son, he's in there for a weapons charge. Now, he's not the killer. He's not the Grim Sleeper. So the question is, can you use his DNA in context of a different crime that he didn't commit. And there are people on both sides of that. You know, there's not only the public reacting to, oh, Big Brother has my DNA, you know that. But it's also really a a question that really should be carefully considered, whether that person's DNA can be used in the context of a crime you know he didn't commit. 
that's again, we can go fast forward to the Golden State Killer. That question is still with us, even more so now that we use genealogy. Although we have had a few cases now in the last two years make their way through the court and have had convictions as a result of forensic genealogy techniques being used. Yeah, but it's just a lead. That's the other thing. It's just a lead. It's probably not going to surprise anyone that listens to this podcast where the brother of a murder victim is going to come down on this thing, which is, I I think this is more than reasonable. This is no different than a fingerprint or another piece of evidence that would be potentially left behind at a crime scene. And yeah. no no one's saying that Lonnie Franklin Jr., who's now dead, no one's saying his son is guilty of anything, but it did provide the LAPD and the prosecutors with a lead that allowed them to pursue an avenue which said someone who is related to this gentleman may be involved in an unsolved series of murders that we've come to call the Grim Sleeper. I come in the same side as you because there's, you know, is DNA special? That's another question. You know, if you say like there's a some kind of crime in a neighborhood, the police come and they talk to a neighbor and they say, you know, we're looking for somebody, you know, that say robbed a bank and he had a green car and where was your neighbor yesterday afternoon? And, and the neighbor is like thinking about, well, I don't know if he was home or not. You know, and the, and the neighbor's son comes out and says, oh, I saw him drive away. You know, he went he went out at lunchtime and I waved at him while he's driving on the street. And, you know, those people are implicated in the crime and, you know, they didn't commit the crime. In a similar way, you know, your DNA, the son's DNA is kind of a, in a way, a witness to the crime, a genetic witness in a way, because and he gets involved with not meaning to. He didn't commit the crime. But people will say DNA is special because it's your genetic blueprint, right? So what exactly? You're not just pulling in the neighbors saying, you know, the truck drove down the street. You're actually pulling in some kind of genetic blueprint of the son inadvertently or advertently for a purpose that it was not intended to be used for in the first place. But I say that I weigh in on public safety. It's better to do that. And there's not that many familial searches. I mean, it's not rampant. We all don't have to run for the hills. I mean, it's done very thoughtfully and carefully. And I think that in the interest of public safety, I'm for it. You know, rather than keep that one person safe who was not involved in the crime, keep him safe and not be able to catch the real person we're after. Well, back to your bank robber example. If they said, well, we saw a six foot tall white man with reddish hair outside the bank. And, you know, that's the description. Well, you know, I fit that description. I don't think my hair is as red as it used to be, (laughs) Uh (laughs) but it used to be very bright red. And so that would be, but that's a, you know, that's a characteristic of me. I'm the suspect in this example Uh that could, you know, that's part of my genetic makeup too. Just like you were talking about the green car, and the neighbor seeing the suspect drive out of the driveway with the with the green car half hour before uh-huh. the bank got robbed, I, I'm not resentful of the fact that they might take a look at Bill Thomas to see if I could have been involved in the bank robbery because I was a six foot tall man yeah. with with formerly red hair. <laughs> yeah, but it's funny people get really hinky about the DNA thing. Right. Well, they're afraid. You know, I think the f- part of the fear is DNA is so well regarded as evidence. So I think they're afraid that, you know, their DNA will implicate them in something. And they're really innocent and they get trapped into Kafka-esque system where they didn't do it, you know, and it, it, they, they can't get out because their DNA happens to match or happens to be. And they're all false convictions. You know, one of the reasons that the authorities don't want to go back, say, and test the DNA of people who have been executed on death row, because they don't want to find out they've executed innocent people. And yet, I think any fair-minded person would have to admit that that has happened here in the United States. and, and It has. That's lamentable. At the same time, the fantastic work that can be done 
by people like the Innocence Project, a good portion of that uh-huh. is facilitated through DNA and other advanced forensic testing to determine uh-huh. that somebody that may have been incarcerated is, is innocent is innocent and deserves to be let out of jail yeah. as soon as possible. Right. I think that the chance, you know, chance of being falsely convicted based on DNA is almost zero. I mean, I wouldn't say absolute zero because, you know, I'm a scientist. I'm never going to tell you zero or 100 percent. I know when I first worked on Sarah Yarborough in 2011 that, you know, one of the reactions of the one of the comments made by the genealogy community was, God, you don't know how many people have been falsely accused with DNA. You know, it was like a reaction from somebody who, you know, really didn't understand the process there. And I said, can you give me one example? Gosh, I didn't know that. Right. And, you know, it went away. It went silent. No, you know. And they couldn't because, do it. Right. So I think DNA is more important to show some, just as important to show someone's innocence as it is his guilt. Mind Over Murder is a production of Absolute Zero and Another Dog Productions. Our executive producers are Bill Thomas and Kristen Dilley. Our logo art is by Pamela Arnois. Our theme music is by Kevin McLeod. Mind Over Murder is distributed in partnership with Crawl Space Media. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. You can also follow our page on the Colonial Parkway Murders on Facebook. And finally, you can follow Bill Thomas on Twitter at BillThomas56. Thank you for listening to Mind Over Murder.